All right, so I'm uh, want to talk to you today about uh, integrated and circuit scaling and what we've done to, to bring us to the uh, 10 nanometer generation and some of the devices and the options we're pursuing to go beyond uh, 10 nanometers. This is the uh, statement that Gordon Moore made uh, uh, more than 50 years ago now. Uh, he said that the number of transistors and resistors on a chip uh, will double about every 24 months. And of course that led to what we now know as Moore's Law. And there are two implications of scaling, two implications of following Moore's Law. Number one, as you scale devices, uh, transistors cost less. And number two, product performance or functionality increases as you add more transistors, either to the memory chip or to the microprocessor chip. And this is uh, Intel's trend in scaling uh, minimum feature size, you know, since uh, the early uh, 1970s. Uh, uh, there was an inflection point there right around the middle 1990s when uh, instead of a doubling uh, transistor density or, or uh, scaling dimensional features by 0.7x every three years, we started to accelerate the pace and have been scaling feature size by about 0.7x uh, every two years. And of course we do that to achieve uh, improved performance, lower cost, and uh, also uh, lower power. <coughs> But it's been uh, many generations now when simple scaling was good enough. Uh, for the past 15 or more years, we've had to continually uh, innovate, come up with new transistor structures and new transistor materials in order to enable scaling. <coughs> and then these are some of the uh, key examples that uh, Intel led the way on. Our 90 nanometer technology uh, back in uh, 1993 uh, introduced strained silicon, where we uh, added silicon germanium to the source drains on the either side of the PMOS device, imparted a compressive strain on the silicon atoms in the channel that improved a hole mobility. And we did the opposite on the NMOS. We added a tensile layer to create a, a tensile strain in the channel, and that increased uh, electron mobility. <coughs> Next big change was uh, on our high K metal gate uh, technology, uh, where we changed the uh, gate insulator from SiO2 to a hafnium-based uh, high-K material and replaced the dope polysilicon gate electrode with uh, uh, special metal materials to provide the right work function. And then next, uh, we also started to pay attention to interconnects. Uh, uh, interconnect scaling is just a, as important to microprocessors as transistor scaling. So we uh, invented something called cephaline vias to make sure that all the vias and metal wires would be in place, uh, especially important as you scale to very small dimensions. And then uh, our 22 nanometer technology, we introduced uh, uh, FinFET transistors or three-dimensional uh, uh, fin structure, and that provided some great uh, sub-threshold and, and short channel characteristics. And then on recent uh, 14 and 10 nanometer technologies, we've employed uh, what we call a hyperscaling techniques to get even better scaling than normal uh, for those generations. And I'll explain what they are on coming slides. So on our 14 nanometer technology, uh, we scaled uh, the fin pitch from 60 nanometers to 42. So that's a pretty normal 0.7x scaling. But we did uh, unusually uh, good interconnect scaling uh, from 80 to 52, that was a 0.65x. And the logic cell height, in other words, how many transistors or you can pack into a logic cell, we, we scaled that logic cell area uh, by 0.48x. Um, so that was unusually good. And gate pitch, the transistor gate pitch, we scaled from 90 nanometers to 70 nanometers. So this combination of scaling features provided not just the normal 0.5x area scaling that you would want on a new generation, but closer to 0.37x. So we took a, a bigger step than normal in scaling from our uh, 22 nanometer generation to this 14 nanometer. And we described that as hyperscaling, achieving better than normal area scaling. <coughs> and our 14 nanometer technology has been in high volume production uh, since 2014 on a wide range of products from uh, small mobile chips to uh, a larger client die or client chips that you might have in your, in your laptops or desktops and even the very large uh, 
uh, chips that have uh, many cores on them and used in a, a data center or server chips or server products. So that was 14. Now, again, on our recent 10 nanometer technology, we employed hyperscaling techniques. Uh, here I start with some of the uh, simple pitch scaling numbers that we achieved. We scaled the fin pitch from 42 to 34 nanometers, uh, the metal pitch from 52 to 36 nanometers, the logic cell height from 399 to 272 nanometers, and the transistor gate pitch from 70 to 54 nanometers. So that was good scaling, but not quite enough to achieve the hyperscaling goal we set for ourselves on this uh, 10 nanometer generation. So we added some other uh, unique features that provided a better scaling, something called a, a single dummy gate, and I'll explain that in another few slides, and the other thing, uh, allowing contacts to be placed right over active gates instead of off to the side. So with this combination of pitch scaling and added or improved features like single dummy gate and contact over active gate, we were again able to achieve not just 0.5x area scaling, from our 14 to our 10, but another 0.37x uh, area scaling. <clears throat> so here are some actual uh, micrographs of the uh, devices on our 10 nanometer technology. Starting on the left there, you can see the uh, uh, silicon fins for the uh, fin-fed transistors. We scale their pitch, uh, the center-to-center -center spacing, down to 34 nanometers. Uh, in the middle there is the uh, uh, the transistor gates with the uh, source drain in between, and that gate pitch was uh, scaled down to uh, 54 nanometers. And on the, on the right is uh, one, of the in, one of the many intercrack layers on this process, and, and uh, the three lowest layers, metal zero, metal one, and metal two, have uh, minimum pitches of uh, 40, 36, and 44 nanometers. <coughs> so I mentioned a single dummy gate as a uh, one of the innovations on this 10 nanometer technology. <clears throat> so let's start with the uh, cartoon on the left. I show a kind of a top view of a logic cell. Uh, the gray lines going horizontally, those are the silicon fins for the transistors. Uh, uh, the green rectangles oriented vertically, those would be the transistor gates. Um, and you might have some logic cell that would have uh, X number of transistors in it. So the, the width of the cell would vary, but not, not the height. And for many generations, we've had to use two dummy gates at the cell borders on the left and the right to separate the logic function that occurs in, in that logic cell from what's happening in the cell to the left or to the right. So if you have to add uh, two dummy gates, you've wasted some area, but that's uh, all we knew how to do. <clears throat> but on this 10 nanometer generation, we uh, invented or developed a process that allows or requires only a single dummy gate. So you save area with a single dummy gate structure versus a, a double dummy gate. <coughs> and that gate is formed by <coughs> etching a trench through what would have been a, a gate electrode and filling it up with an isolation. And you can see uh, the actual micrograph of that uh, on the right. So now you have this very good isolation between two active transistors on either side of that cell border. So uh, all the electrical function, functions happening in the cell on the left do not impact the electrical functions happening to the cell on the right. <coughs> the other new invention was uh, something we call contact overactive gate. So again, I show uh, some top-down cartoons there on the left. Uh, uh, the far left, the, the standard layout uh, which our industry has done forever since we've had MOSFETs, is you, you may have a, a contact over the source drain on the left or the right side of the gate electrode, but the gate contact had to be off, uh, uh, away from the active region on top of the isolation region. Because uh, otherwise you would short to the source drains and the, the transistor wouldn't function. But that obviously wastes some area. So in the middle there, we developed this COAG process that allows the gate contact to be placed right over the active gate, not wasting any area. And that, that's been a big factor in our, uh, our ability to achieve this 0.37x area scaling. And on the right is, uh, again, a, 
highly magnified uh, image cross section of the transistors where you can see uh, uh, the, a gate, the source drain, another gate, another source drain, and you can see the metal zero layer, and you can see the the contact coming right down and self-aligned to the gate electrode below it, uh, not shorting to the source drain on either the left or the right. <coughs> so on, on our 10 nanometer technology, the logic cell is uh, 272 nanometers tall, and you can pack in as many as uh, five active fins in that height. And the, the, the width of the uh, logic cell varies by how many gates you have, but since I I have two active gates in this example and, and one dummy gate at the cell border. It would be three gate pitches wide or 162 nanometers. And then I, I just continue the build there. And next I show that same cell with the metal zero layer or the metal zero wires uh, pattern above it. And, and the X's show the contacts that come down either to the gates or to the source drains. And then the next build over, I show the next metal layer, the metal one layer in blue. And the, the black squares are all the, the pin hit locations. So that's a phrase that means uh, where the metal two wires are free to connect to the metal one wires. <clears throat> so th this is a very dense logic cell, both in terms of its X and Y dimensions, but also the ability for the metal two wires that are right above that to connect almost anywhere into the cell. So that leads to very efficient logic routing on the chip. So this uh, is a busy table summarizing the uh, minimum uh, pitches or minimum design rules on the key layers uh, on this technology, starting at the top of uh, the, the fin, then the, the gate electrode, then the metal layers from metal zero all the way down to uh, uh, the topmost layer, the thick metal one layer. Um, uh, next column over, I show the patterning technique. And uh, this is the first technology in our industry to use uh, self-aligned quad patterning, where we're uh, effectively using 193 nanometer light to pattern uh, fins with a pitch of 34 nanometers. And that needs a what we call a quad patterning uh, process to get down to that. Some of the uh, other layers use uh, an older technology, self-aligned uh, double, uh, double patterning. But uh, this is the first uh, technology to use quad patterning to get us down to pitches like 34, 40, and, and 36. Most of the metal layers on this technology use copper because copper has both a, a low resistance, uh, uh, good conductivity, and a, a good uh, electromigration reliability. But the three lowest layers, um, uh, metal one, metal zero, and the contacted gate, uh, we introduced uh, for the first time cobalt and tungsten as the metal layers because they have much better electromigration reliability. They're more resistive than copper, but these are very uh, tiny wires with a small cross-sectional area, and thus they have to have a, carry a, a high current density. <clears throat> and the high current density can lead to uh, electromigration failures, uh, or they would with copper. But cobalt and tungsten are much more resistant to electromigration and are better suited for those uh, fine pitch layers. This is a uh, graph of the uh, IV characteristics uh, of our 10 nanometer transistors, uh, um, PMOS on the left, uh, NMOS on the right, and I'll just draw your attention to uh, the subthreshold slopes. Uh, with FinFETs, we're able to uh, achieve uh, about 75 millivolts per decade subthreshold slopes, and very low dibble values, uh, drain-induced barrier lowering, uh, of about 90 millivolts uh, per volt. So these are well-controlled devices with a uh, high on currents and uh, low off currents. <coughs> and as I mentioned before, the trans transistor gate pitch is 54 nanometers, and the physical gate length is around 18 nanometers. Here I show the uh, saturated drive currents uh, on the horizontal scale versus the uh, off-state leakage on the vertical scale, for the, again, for uh, um, Oh, I forgot my label. <laughs> I think it's NMOS on the left and PMOS on the right, but I'm sorry, I, I grabbed those from another presentation. No. But I think the, the key point of this graph is uh, every generation, we strive to not just make transistors smaller so we can pack more of them onto a chip, but make them faster as well. 
So on, a, on a, I believe that the NMOS device on the left, we achieved about a 71% uh, drive current increase over our previous 14 nanometer generation. And for the PMOS on the right, uh, about a 35% uh, increase. Uh, so those are significant performance gains uh, over the previous generation. <coughs> so getting back, getting back to the uh, message of Moore's law and the need to scale transistor area and reduce cost. Uh, here is a, a plot uh, where I, I take a uh, hypothetical logic cell and I can measure the relative area scaling going from Intel's 45 to 32 to 22 to 14 and now to the 10 nanometer generation. And that logic cell scales by uh, reducing the uh, gate pitch in the horizontal dimension, reducing the cell height in the vertical dimension. That's a pretty simple metric, not a very comprehensive metric, but one that uh, uh, most people you know, can understand. And if I use that metric and apply it to our technologies, as you can see, our 32 nanometer generation achieved about a 0.49x area scaling, close to the historic 0.5x trend. Did a little bit better than that on our 22 nanometer technology uh, with a 0.45x area scaling. But now on our 14 and our 10, by use of the hyperscaling techniques I mentioned earlier, we're able to achieve about a 0.37x uh, area scaling. But this is a pretty simple metric, and uh, it's easy to miss some other important design rules that can limit logic area scaling. Um, so to address that, we use a more comprehensive transistor density metric. Uh, Mostly, it's really an historic metric that other companies have used in the past, but uh, maybe not so much recently. But I think it's a, a very useful metric. It's a more comprehensive metric, and I think a more honest metric about uh, comparing transistor density. And this is a metric that uses two very common logic cells, a very simple two-input NAND cell shown there on the left, and a more complex uh, scan flip-flop logic cell. So these are two very common cells used in logic, and they kind of cover the span from about the simplest cell you can use um, about the most complex cell. So the way this metric works is you measure the, the area of each cell and the number of transistors in each cell, and that gives you a transistor density, and you apply a weighting factor that has been historically used, uh, and that's a 60-40 weighting factor, 60% for the NAND, 40% for the scan flip-flop. So with this metric, you can come up with a a number, a density number for any technology in units of transistors per square millimeter. <clears throat> so if I take that metric and apply it again to the same five generations of Intel logic technology, I come up with, with this trend um, where we've had uh, you know, a little bit better than 2x scaling on 32 and 22, but closer to a 2.5 and 2.7x transistor density improvement on our 14 and our 10 nanometer technologies. But you know, what is true is that some of, the, our, some of our modern technologies, because they're much more complex, they have more masking steps, it's taking us longer to develop them. So we're no longer on a pace of a new technology every two years. It's more like two and a half or three years. But even, if that, even with that longer time to develop the technology, the fact that we're taking a bigger step is still keeping us on this trend line of roughly doubling transistor density every two years. <coughs> and th these are, again, the actual measured uh, transistor densities on these technologies. Uh, back at the 45 nanometer generation, uh, it was about... Uh, 3.3 million transistors per square millimeter. On our 10 nanometer technology, we're just slightly above 100 million transistors per square millimeter. <clears throat> so again, I want to come back to the benefits of a hyperscaling. Um, and although the logic transistor density that I just quoted to you is an important component of a microprocessor chip, there are some circuit blocks on a, on a microprocessor that don't scale as well as the logic. Uh, the SRAM blocks may not scale at the same pace. The uh, IO circuits may not scale at the same pace. 
So when you look at a typical microprocessor chip uh, over the past uh, four or five generations, their scale factors uh, have been around 0.62x. And if we had continued that trend on 14 and 10, we would have uh, achieved a, a, a CPU chip size uh, starting with 100 square millimeters of 23.8 and 14.8 if we had used normal scaling and normal scale factors. But we didn't do that. We used hyperscaling on 14 and 10. So we, we achieved a much better chip area scaling and uh, smaller chips. So again, a, a 45 nanometer chip that may have started at uh, a hypothetical 100 square millimeters would scale to 17.7 and maybe 7.6 square millimeters with the same number of transistors, the same functions. <clears throat> As I stated at the start, one of the important goals of Moore's Law is to reduce the cost per transistor. So here are three graphs that show how that can happen. And this is, uh, I'll start with the hypothetical case. Uh, graph on the left is uh, uh, area per transistor, coming down maybe at that 0.62x historic trend. Uh, middle graph shows how we have to continually spend more money on our wafers as we add more masking steps, so the wafers become more expensive. And the result of uh, the first graph multiplied by the middle graph yields the, the third graph on the right. Uh, cost per transistor would come down, but it would start slowing down. In other words, it wouldn't be improving at the same rate we had in the past. Again, because of the increasing wafer cost. <clears throat> so what can we do to avoid that, to achieve better uh, cost reduction? Well, one, I'd, one option that our industry has been exploring for several years now is to convert to a larger wafer. A yeah, larger wafer, you, you can pack more transistors onto that wafer. Uh, the wafer cost uh, won't necessarily go up uh, proportional to the area, so you can achieve lower cost per transistor. So if we had uh, converted to a 450 millimeter wafer instead of 300 millimeter at the 14 nanometer generation, we would have had that one-time cost reduction, the inflection point in that graph, and that would have delivered some uh, a better uh, cost per transistor results on that far right-hand graph. <coughs> but the industry hasn't done that yet. The, the, the uh, cost of converting fabs from a 300, mil 300 millimeter wafers to 450 is pretty, uh, pretty high, and we don't think that's, at this point, the best step to take. And this is what, what Intel did. As I mentioned earlier, uh, starting with the far left-hand graph, we, we did better than normal scaling. We did hyperscaling. So we were below that normal trend line in terms of uh, area per transistor. Uh, cost per wafer or cost per square millimeter is still going up, so that's not changed. But the result of that uh, hyperscaled graph on the left and the cost graph in the middle yields a cost per transistor graph that looks a, a lot more attractive. Uh, not only continuing to reduce cost per transistor, but at a slightly faster rate than we have in the past. So that's really... Uh, in a nutshell, the key benefit of hyperscaling. <clears throat> so again, as I mentioned earlier, one of the, uh, uh, another goal of, of following Moore's Law in scaling is not just to make transistors smaller and, and cheaper, but to achieve a better performance. So here are three graphs uh, for our recent technologies. Uh, first graph, showing how we've increased performance at each generation. Middle graph showing how we've reduced the power consumed, the active power consumed by transistors as we scale. And then maybe the, the most important graph is just a, a performance per watt, uh, just the ratio of the, those first two graphs. So each generation, as we make transistors smaller, we're improving performance, we're reducing power, and improving performance per watt. Now, it's important maybe to point out at this, this point that uh, uh, not all products uh, uh, in the market today choose to take this goodness, this improved technology for raw speed improvement. What's really more important to our customers, both consumers in the marketplace as well as uh, companies that build large data centers, is they want improved power efficiency more than they want improved performance. 
And they, from the consumer's perspective, they want longer battery life in their laptops and on their cell phones. From the data center's perspective, they don't want to spend millions of dollars to cool their building because the processors use so much power. So they want to reduce the power consumption of these chips. So our, the demands we see in the marketplace are not just uh, not focused on, on higher performance, but much more on improved uh, performance per watt. <coughs> and something else uh, we've been doing in recent generations um, is to develop enhanced versions of them after the initial version is, uh, is you know, developed and, and starts shipping. Uh, so for example, we did a, a, a 14 nanometer technology followed by what we call 14 plus and then plus plus. So we've improved performance. Um, and then now on our 10 nanometer technology, we, we, we started with the 10. We already have a 10 plus and a 10 double plus technology provide, uh, planned. <coughs> that should keep improving performance per watt and, and allow us to deliver upgrade, upgraded products as we go from the first year to the second to, to the third year. And we don't do just one version of each technology. We have to support a wide range of products, and we have to add some uh, other features for some uh, products. Uh, for example, the lead CPU uh, version of the technology, they may value high performance transistors and precision resistors and MEM capacitors, but some of the following SOC products want some other devices added, low, special low leakage transistors or uh, analog RF transistors, high voltage IO transistors, and high Q inductors. So we had those other features for other products. So we have different derivatives of any given technology. And different integrated stacks, which is what the uh, cartoon on the right shows. Uh, maybe a, a version with uh, eight layers, another version with 10 or 12, depending on what uh, the products require. So I've talked about uh, what we've done up through the 14 and the 10 nanometer technology. Now let me talk about uh, some of the technologies and devices that are being researched for future generations. So first of all, if we want to pattern some other features, we have to find a way to do that. Um, this graph shows how feature size in blue has been scaling you know, each generation. And now it is well below the wavelength of light we use to pattern it. So the wavelength is 193 nanometers, and yet we're patterning 14 and 10 nanometer feature sizes. And we've done that by employing other lithography tricks or techniques, optical proximity correction, uh, phase shift masks, double patterning, and then uh, quad patterning <laughs> techniques. But what's really needed now, and, and is just a, a few years away from uh, volume manufacturing, is uh, extreme ultraviolet uh, tools where the wavelength of light is reduced from 193 nanometers down to 13.5. So we have several of these tools in our development fab now and expect to have uh, that used on our next generation uh, in a few years. What about uh, transistor technologies? Well, FinFETs were a, a, a big step forward when we introduced them on our 22 nanometer technology. But eventually we'll need something better. Um, and one idea being uh, researched is uh, nanowire or gate all around transistors. Uh, the FinFETs you know, really uh, were quite valuable because of the improved electrostatics, and nanowires would be even better for, for electrostatics. That, that's shown in the graph on, on the right there, where you can achieve uh, very steep subthreshold slopes and very low dibble values with. Uh, nanowire devices. We're also exploring uh, transistors using 3.5 materials in the channel. And of course, obviously, 3.5 can provide much higher mobility. Um, but our goal is not to use increased mobility to provide higher performance. Uh, again, I'll go back and make the point that what we really desire is improved uh, power efficiency. So we want to use the increased mobility that uh, uh, a semiconductor like indium antimonide or indium gallium arsenide can provide to allow us to operate not at 0.7 volts, but maybe at uh, 0.5 volts or lower. And that will provide a, a very significant active power reduction. 
Another unique device that we've been exploring now is uh, something called a, a tunnel FET. So instead of a MOSFET that uh, modulates current in the channel by modulating the, the height of the barrier between source and drain, and instead it modulates the width of the barrier between source and drain. So the carriers can tunnel through that barrier. Now why is that a desirable device? Well, the reason is because you can achieve a, a much steeper sub-threshold slope than any normal silicon transistor can. And if you have a very steep sub-threshold slope, then you can operate these devices at a very low voltage, below 0.5 volts, which again will lead to a very significant reduction in active power consumption. <coughs> and then we have to think even beyond uh, CMOS, what, what will come beyond that. So um, certainly a lot of uh, uh, spintronic devices that have been proposed by research groups around the world, and this is just a few of the, of the many that, that uh, have been published. Um, and it can be pretty confusing to both the researchers and maybe us in the industry about, well, which of these uh, unique uh, structures can really be useful for integrated circuits. And I, I think the way to address that, uh, as was proposed by uh, uh, another senior fellow at Intel, Ian Young, is to develop a, a, a specific metric to um, benchmark any of these device types. And the uh, metric he proposed is, uh, uh, and this would be through simulations, not actual silicon, actual uh, measure devices, but uh, apply those spintronic devices or any other device to uh, an arithmetic logic unit and measure its energy versus delay. So here's a, a plot of uh, energy in the vertical scale in femtojoules versus uh, delay in picoseconds for this simulated 32-bit uh, ALU. And I sh show two yellow points there for uh, you know, modern or typical high-performance and low-power CMOS technologies. So if, if you're out there and you've got some novel device, whether it's Spintronics or some other device, <coughs> It needs to be demonstrably better than CMOS in one of these axes, if not both, to be considered uh, interesting. So the survey work that, uh, uh, that this team, uh, Nikonoff and, and Young did at Intel a couple of years ago, they did a survey of all these, these publications on a wide range of devices. In the fine print there on the right, uh, almost uh, too many, but uh, um, and they, they come in maybe different families, I'll say. There's the uh, Spintronics group in the upper right, uh, Magnetoelectric uh, group uh, to the right there, some ferroelectric devices in the middle, and then some tunneling devices there uh, in the middle and maybe to the left. And when he did simulations of all these devices based on their published characteristics, this is where they landed relative to CMOS. So some of them really don't look very useful. You know, they're, uh, they use more energy than CMOS, so they're slower than CMOS, so why bother? Um, but a few are beginning to emerge as, as quite interesting. They, and at, at least at this point in time, in 2015, it was the tunneling devices that, that showed the most promise for providing reasonable delay, maybe similar to CMOS, but uh, uh, at lower energy. Now, all of these devices are arguably uh, immature, and that, that's okay, but this is a, a method, a benchmarking method, to help to winnow out you know, the non-promising approaches and help researchers around the world focus on what to really get uh, more attention, more thought, more experimentation. <coughs> and although it might be easy to say, well, let, let's dismiss the spintronics here in the upper right, um, uh, or the magnetoelectric in the uh, lower right, uh, because they're neither faster nor lower power than CMOS, they have some other interesting uh, um, attributes. They're, they're non-volatile. So that can really provide some interesting capabilities for computer architecture if you can just shut off circuits completely uh, and then turn them back on and they come back to the same state they were at uh, when you shut them off. So I think those uh, are interesting maybe for some very low power applications. <coughs> Excuse me.
So perhaps uh, one message you may have already uh, observed is, you know, life is not going to be simpler as we go forward. The day of having a silicon NMOS transistor and a silicon PMOS transistor and putting them together on a chip and doing everything you want is uh, probably close to coming, uh, becoming behind us. We're going to be dealing with a much wider range of materials and devices, and they won't uh, all integrate nicely on one piece of silicon. So I think we're really uh, headed towards a heterogeneous silicon integration era where there will be different technologies optimized for different applications, whether it's high-performance computing or low-power computing or memory applications or, or RF and analog applications. So we do really need to start thinking about uh, um, ways to integrate these uh, different materials into a small package, uh, and either by uh, uh, SOC integration, which is probably going to be pretty hard for some of these devices, or 3D integration where you can stack different chips using different processes in a small form factor and yet achieve uh, the best feature that each technology can, can provide. All right, so my voice just barely held out, uh, so I can get, get to my summary here. Scaling continues to deliver the promises of Moore's Law, lower cost per transistor, and improved performance per watt. Innovations in both device materials and device structures are needed to continue scaling. Our industry is moving from a homogenous era to a heterogeneous era of many different devices using a wide range of materials. And system on chip and system and package techniques will be increasingly used to improve system performance and power in ever smaller form factors. And my last slide, my, my shameful advertisement, uh, this is where I work. This is uh, the Intel R&D campus in Hillsborough, Oregon. Uh, all those technologies I described were developed there and we do the early manufacturing, volume manufacturing at that site. Uh, three large clean rooms on that site. Uh, uh, all connected, so that really now they operate as like one virtual fab. And there are about 2,000 PhDs working there. I hope some of you will want to join us. So thank you. I'll stop now and uh, open for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this, even when you're under the weather. All right, questions there? <coughs> What do I think about process changes to, to integrate compute blocks with memory? Uh, that's a, a very good point, I, which I maybe touched on towards the end there, but uh, dense memory technologies are n not anything like uh, good uh, high-performance logic technology. So we need to find ways to integrate them, uh, connect them together in a more compact form with a wide bus, high bandwidth bus between the two. So there's a lot of research going on in that area. A lot of 3D stacking ideas maybe. Mark, can you comment on uh, if uh, from generation to generation process variations are remaining about the same or getting worse or getting better? <clears throat> so I think the question was, do, do process variations get the same or worse from generation to generation? And I get, I've gotten that question every 10 years for the last 30 years. And the answer is, somehow we managed to get it to work. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I, I would say it's about about the same proportionally, yes. <coughs> Any other hands? Yes, thank you very much for this uh, nice talk. You show some picture of uh, a transistor there, especially quant the quantum wire transistor. W what would be actually an optimum size for the cross-section of the wire? And uh, I show also that you show also that... Yeah. So I, I think the question was, uh, for a nanowire transistor, what's the optimal size for those wires? Uh, um, and our internal answer pretty much matched a paper that was at IEDM just a few months ago, last month, uh, around 5 nanometers diameter. These are silicon wires? Uh, for silicon, yes. Yeah. And what would be actually the gate length is of the order of uh, 14 nanometer? Oh, well, I don't think we've identified yet... Uh, just how small the gate length can go, but it should be able to get down to 10 nanometers. What's the, I don't, 
once this e, um, EUV technology comes into operation, is this going to be a dramatic change in the way things work? I mean, it really looked like that on your slide. Yeah, that's a good, an interesting question. <coughs> oh, there it is. Okay. Many, many of us, many of us in the industry thought we would need EUV back at the 32 or 22 nanometer generation, but uh, the lithography community worldwide is just too clever, and the companies that pay them are too desperate. So we, they, we, we came up with solutions. So, uh, but I think we're just about at the end of the practical road for innovations on, on 193 litho, and we do need EUV. Um, uh, but EUV is darn expensive. Um, and it, if it were a, a, an inexpensive tool, I would say, yes, it's going to be a revolution. But it is so darn expensive, it's, uh, it's got that, uh, that problem. Why is it so expensive? <coughs> uh, th the tool is, is so big. Um, here, here, an interesting story. Dur during my uh, time here at Illinois, one of my summer jobs was at the Reynolds Aluminum plant up in LaGrange. I don't know if anybody know that. It's no longer there, but uh, a huge plant with big overhead cranes to lift these big aluminum ingots from A to B. Uh, I was shocked a year ago when I went into our fab and saw, uh, to our fab, big overhead cranes to move the EUV tools in and out. You know. And, and the, the pedestal, the simple looking iron pedestal that you rest the EUV tool on costs a million dollars. That, that's just the pedestal. So it's just, you know, uh, EUV technology, it's not just like a light bulb and a lens. Um, um, it, you, you, you take some tin and you melt it and a little droplet of tin comes down and you blast it with a laser and then the EUV light emits from that you got to collect it, and um, of course EUV is not a refractive technology, it has to be a reflective technology. So you have to have these special mirrors uh, um, that have you know, 40 layers to, to reflect the EUV light uh, and collect it. Uh, it is a monster of a machine. It's been worked on by Intel and, and, and many, of the, many of the big companies in the industry for 20 years. It's just, it's, it's big. Can I ask you a question about the, uh, the uh, back end? You introduced the cobalt in this generation, and it is not as conductive as copper, <coughs> but better electrical uh, migration. Yes. So is cobalt going to stay? Are you, are you, uh, what other metals are, are the candidates there? Well, co cobalt and tungsten are, are two uh, uh, pretty good layers for that, for that application. Yes, they are not as conductive as copper, um, but they have much better current carrying capabilities. And so that's, that's a good combination of features for those lower interconnects that don't have to go very far, so the wire resistance isn't too important, but the reliability and density is very important. Now, is there another metal beyond uh, cobalt or tungsten? Uh, uh, please let me know when you find it. So. <laughs> In your opinion, since we're uh, as we scale down the transistors, we're reaching the physical limit where we have to deal with like short channel effects, stuff like that. Um, in your opinion, what do you think is the future of transistors as we scale down? Are you asking how, how short can we scale channel length? And then, and then, how do we how do we address that in the future? Um, well, we've we've done a lot of I think uh, important things to enable channel length scaling. One one of the things we did. Uh, uh, on our second generation of FinFeds, get all the doping out of the channel. So random do doping fluctuations no longer a, a factor. Um, but there are uh, other factors that limit scaling. Electrostatics, we're trying to deal with that by, by going to a gate all around. <coughs> um, and, and there may be a time when we uh, uh, can't scale the, the channel length anymore on a CMOS device. And then to get area scaling, you start stacking them. So stacking CMOS devices may be method. Uh, and spintronic devices, you know, as a density improvement, are, are pretty significant. Uh, they don't have the performance that CMOS does, but they, they can be pretty dense. Can I ask you no more questions? Maybe back one? Why don't you just start it up? And... 
How, how does scaling from uh, 14 to 10 affect yield? Actually, at every step, you know, we're going 22 to 14, 14 to 10 uh, is a yield challenge. So you never achieve uh, very good yields in the first year. So the team of engineers just keep hammering away, you know, what, you know, what are all my sources of defects or uh, sources of variation and how do I eliminate them? So the first year of production yield may be here and second year it's there and then the, maybe by the third year it's all at a stable high, high level. Okay. Well, maybe it's time to break here. I'll, I will hang around if any of you want to come up and ask me other questions, but uh, thank you for coming. Sorry we didn't have more seats. <laughs>